How do we get different software systems to communicate? I'll give you the most popular answer. By volume, surely the most popular answer is HTTP. I will send the other side a structured message, which I'll call a request, and I'll wait until it returns a structured response. Easy. It's tough to say what the next most popular technique is, but I'm going to suggest it's relational databases. I want to send data to other people, so I'll just stick it in the database and I'm done. I don't need to know who reads it or when they read it, how many times they read it, or for what purpose. As long as I've stuck it in the database, the messaging is done from my side. And if you can think about that as a messaging system, you can actually start categorizing all these different solutions. Actor models. I send the message, I know who I'm sending it to, but I don't actually care if they receive it. I'm not expecting a reply, it's fire and forget. Cues. I'll send the message, I don't know who's going to receive it, but my expectation is it will be dealt with exactly once and then used up. All these different patterns of communication, they all have their own fundamental shape. And in theory, what we would do is pick the right shape for the task each time. But in practice, I don't think we do that. It, it ends up being so much work to agree on a REST interface or RabbitMQ or Kafka or whatever. It's so much work to get all the teams to agree on it that once you've done it once, you don't want to change it. So you end up picking the technology and then making future problems fit the solution. Or do you? My guest this week is Jeremy Sines, and he's arguing for a world where we agree on one communication toolkit that can do request response and cues and actor style messaging and more, depending on how you configure each connection. The tool in question is NATS, and a lot of my friends have been saying I should put NATS under the spotlight, so we're going to dive in and see what makes it tick. Before we do, I have a quick announcement to make. Somebody said to me this week that they loved the podcast, thank you very much, and that I was crazy to give it away for free. And I thought, well, there's no way this is going behind a paywall. That's not what I'm doing. That's not why I'm doing it. I want these developer voices to be heard. But it is crazy that I haven't even ever opened the door to support. So if you're one of the people that wants to support us being around for the long term, if you're a company that wants an easy way to sponsor us, that should have always been possible, and now it is. Starting this week, Developer Voices has a Patreon account and YouTube memberships. Links in the show notes if you want to support us, and I'll say some more at the end. But for now, let's get back on track and get back to the main kind of messaging. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Jeremy Sines. I'm joined today by Jeremy Sines. Jeremy, how are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm um, looking forward to picking apart what it is you work on, because uh, I know it from the surface, but I don't know nearly enough enough depth to make me happy. So you're going to fix yeah. that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to it, but it is it is really, really fun to talk about. So excited cool. to well, chat more about it today. Well, let me, let me back up a bit before we get into this, because... Um, there are lots of these th things in the similar space, like people have heard of RabbitMQ, there's Apache Kafka, there's Pulsar, and it can all get a bit overwhelming. So let's back right up, forget about the technology for a second, and what problems is Nats going to solve for me? Why should I even care? Yeah, and so, I mean, uh, like you said, I mean, we, 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 think, we talk about these technologies all the time and and typically you'll you know what conventional wisdom will will tell you is that you know pick pick a technology that does like one thing really really well and then take all those technologies and somehow string them together into a cohesive system and yeah. for for a lot of things that can really work particularly well but one thing that I think we've been noticing that the folks who who work and work on and maintain nats is that um, it's kind of spiraled a little bit out of control a bit with the amount of technologies um, 
that's involved. And, and even like from a, from even like a business or a velocity perspective, like um, there's a lot of great wisdom around saying, Hey, can we create these teams that are empowered to go work on these problems like more autonomously? Right. Right. Um, But running counter to that is saying, okay, now these teams need to be responsible for, you know, the, the, the development and the operation of this thing. And by the way, you have to use like 20 different technologies and figure out how they all integrate together. And it's kind of like, in a lot of ways, setting teams up for a lot of frustration and potential failure when um, you're expecting so much, not only knowledge, but um, just general effort out of the teams to be able to pull this off. And so um, I, I say that by by um, trying to frame like some of the problems that we're trying to solve, which um, generally revolves around what does it look like for a team to build out a, a true like distributed system. And uh, if you were to go the one route of saying, we're going to pick all of these kind of like um, single, you know, specialized technologies and string them all together, it can get very complicated very quickly, especially because the properties of a distributed system um, kind of run counter to like uh, some of these technologies that are tried and true that we love to pull off the shelf. Um and so I think what Nats is trying to address is this idea that like can we can we get a team to like build something like a you know a distributed system and I could talk about more what distributed systems mean in a, in a minute but um, can we get a team to be able to build a distributed system in um, in a newer way. Uh, can we have them build a microservices architecture in in a maybe more novel and new way where you're you're really reducing the surface area of the number of technologies that you're using? And that might run counter to conventional wisdom because you know you don't want to say we need to use a Swiss army knife, you know, we use one technology to rule them all. And I'm not claiming that Nats does that, but it simply it, it certainly does help reduce that surface area quite a bit where you're spending less time trying to figure out which technologies, like how, how they may work within those constraints. And, and you're spending more time kind of like working on solving for those harder use cases, like distributed systems and how data flows and, and everything like that. Okay. It seems to me that the problem here is it's not getting one team to build a distributed system. The problem that really comes up is when you're get a, getting distributed teams to try and build yeah. a system together. And I could play devil's advocate here and say, why don't we just all agree on HTTP requests? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, the, one of the problems that we've seen surface with HTTP is that it assumes kind of this one-to-one connection between everybody. Um, And it's, it's funny because we could actually like try to translate this to our terms. It's like, imagine if we just had one-to-one communication all the time where, you know, instead of video conferencing, um, like kind of like we're doing now, even though we're technically one-to-one, we're putting this on a podcast and we're broadcasting it out to people. So there's this kind of async, you know, thing yeah. happening, you know, we're, we're producers, we're also talking to each other. And then there's going to be consumers like watching this podcast. Um, and so like naturally our, le- like the way we communicate has also evolved into this like asynchronous, you know, um, a kind of interest-based consumption. Um, and HTTP, I would say, is kind of back in the dark ages of like, well, we have a telephone book where we have to go look up somebody's telephone number and then we have to call them and then we can have a conversation with them. But to, to scale beyond that seems like we have to do some unnatural acts in order to do that. Um, right, yeah. So you're kind of arguing from first principles that the problem here is how do we communicate? And we've already got some ideas on how communication works in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like and that's one of the things I think Nats does really well that that might be flipping a lot of like these traditional ways we've gone about things on its head, which is like um a lot of ways for like the cloud, it started with compute and then it evolved to like data and then it was like okay, now how do we, we can connect all these things? And and Nats model is actually like the reverse of that, where we started with communication and we're like how do things communicate with each other like you said kind of on a first principles basis and um and and really try to kind of like run against the grain um and, and we're finding really interesting outcomes there is when we can like expand like the the surface area of what it means for things to communicate with each other you can actually like um 
you can get similar outcomes uh, in building software. We 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 want to change the um we we don't want to change the what you're doing, but we want to change how you're doing it. Um, so that like you know smaller teams or even single individuals can go like move mountains inside of an organization instead of just <laughs> growing right. you know teams indefinitely to babysit this technology. Okay, so let's break down exactly how this communication thing works. I, if I wanted to explain RabbitMQ to someone, I'd say, well, do you know what a queue looks like in software programming? And if they do, mm -hmm. we're away. If I want to explain Kafka, I say, do you know what a log file looks like? And we're away. Is there some similar intuition with NATS? Yeah, I mean, so at, at its very kind of core, NATS is a pub-sub architecture. Okay. Um, and and we we, we kind of take that very basic like you know you publish something you subscribe to something um, and it's done so in an ephemeral way so we don't we're not even talking about persistence yet or guarantees we're just talking about hey if you're here and I'm here and we're talking to each other that's great we start with that but then we layer on top of that all of these other ways to express these patterns to the point where we're getting away from, is this a queue system? Is this like a, you know, is this like an append only log? Is this like a key value store? We, we take kind of like all of those, what does this thing specialize in away? And we start saying, these are patterns that you express in a distributed system. And it turns okay. out when you could put that in like, you know, in a singular, you know, distributed system where it's it's more of this like substrate <laughs> where everything kind of joins in and can express multiple versions of these patterns um, all together in one space. Um, but you can actually have like a, a really a really great advantage um, with so that. So, are you saying I could? You, there's always a building block of communication where I can say, I today I'd like it to be request response. Tomorrow I'd like it to be pub sub. And next day, I'd like it to be fan in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and not, and not even iterations, but more like um, being able to mix those things inside of a single application. You know, right. where you might you might have request response between you know these services, but then there's this other service that might be you know having interest in in this particular subject or topic, and they're getting that, and and maybe that stuff is persisted on disk, so there's guarantees, or maybe it's not because we don't really need guarantees for that stuff. It's okay for it to stay ephemeral. You have all those options available to you, and so you could build those applications and express those patterns without being like, oh wait, yeah, we don't have the technology for that yet. Now we have to have a big discussion about like what technology we need to adopt in order to get that. You just kind of, you have those patterns available to you. They're in your toolbox and you're able to use them. Okay. So if I were using HTTP for my microservices and something came up that introduced a queue, is that the point you'd say, aha, you should have joined us? Yeah, yeah, and and the interesting thing is, you know, we have a lot of companies adopting Nats. I like to say it's the technology that's literally running some of the most world's critical, most critical infrastructure that nobody knows about, <laughs> and um, and and most of the reason why people will adopt Nats would be for one thing or the other. Maybe it's like a really standout use case for request reply. Maybe it's about streaming, or maybe it's about just a highly distributed key value store. Um, they come for one thing, but then they start expanding in more use cases because they love the technology, they love how to operate it, and they want it to be in more places. Um, and that's that's kind of what we've seen naturally um, as, as time has gone on. Okay, okay. I can see the high-level pitch then, and that makes mm -hmm. sense to me, that I would want the communication toolkit. Let's get into the how, because mm -hmm. the devil is in the details, right? So yeah. if I... What is the underlying abstraction that unifies request response and key value stores and pub sub? Yeah, so I think there's two kind of core components to it. Um, one is that everything is a message. We're just message passing all over the place. And okay. uh, you know when, what a message contains is you know it contains a subject. Um, and I'll talk about subjects in in a little bit more detail because that's actually a really important primitive as well. But it has a subject, it has headers, and then it just has a payload. Payloads are arbitrary. It could be whatever you want. Uh, but you take these messages and you send them places. Um, and and you, you send them places by being able to define what a subject is. And a subject is just, you know, a series of tokens separated by, you know, a dot. Um, okay. Now, the cool, th the cool thing about these subjects is that you can wildcard them. They're, they're kind of your replacement for, you know, a URL 
or any sort of like universal identifier. Um, and so Nats kind of operates on this idea of interest where you subscribe to a subject or a wild card of a particular subject. And then that, you know, anything that gets sent on that subject, essentially, it's kind of like a channel of sorts will be delivered to you. Um, now, there's a lot of other cool things that go into that. Like, you know, if you're using request response, you could say, yeah, I want to subscribe on this subject, but attached to this, what we call a queue group. And those things will be automatically load balanced between each other. So you don't need a load balancer or a reverse proxy to try to, you know, uh, do that for you. Instead, okay. NAS just does it for you naturally. And so that's like one of the ways you can express patterns of saying, oh, you know, once I, once I actually connect to the NAT server, I don't have to use DNS anymore. <laughs> like NAS kind of facilitates this whole like large scale, like global scale kind of communication layer um, between all those things. Um, and so I'd say like messages and subjects um, are pretty much like that core primitive that ties it all together. And those things like run through all of, run all the way up the stack, you know, to the point right. where if you're doing streaming or if you're doing key value stores, you're storing big blobs of objects, all that stuff is defined by these like semantic expressions of tokens. Um, and you could do a lot of really, really interesting things with those. Okay. That explains individual messages to me mm. and how, but I always think the, the thing that distinguishes these different systems is how they think you should group messages together. Like for instance, Kafka thinks group of messages as a log, RabbitMQ thinks it's a queue structure. How wh I'm trying to get under the hood to mm. how you're joining messages together as you process them. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And so um, moving up the stack a little bit, we started messages and it's, it starts very unopinionated where you're like, you're able to express a lot of these things and send messages around and that's great. But what happens when you need to do like a higher level construct? Well, that's where we, we have a subsystem called Jetstream and Jetstream is kind of our answer to a lot of these like persisted like you know, whether you're using RabbitMQ or you're using Kafka or you're using Redis, um, the, like the, this idea of, okay, we need to start saving these messages somewhere because what happens when one client goes offline and the other one's still sending messages, we need to save them somewhere. And so Jetstream is the answer to that. And the cool part about Jetstream is that the flexibility is also present there. You have this concept of a stream and you have a concept of a consumer. So it sounds very similar to you know some of these other streaming technologies that we've used. But the interesting thing about it is that a stream and a consumer are actually very, very configurable and flexible. They both live on the server, and we have an API for being able to define both of those things. And so um, the, the cool part about it is you can express something like a, um, like a Kafka topic um, it, like via a, a stream and consumer, or you can um, express something like a key value store, um, which is also a construct that we have, but it's really just a stream under the hood. And the reason for that is we take those subjects and we index on each of those unique subjects inside of the stream. And okay. so you get a you get a little bit of an advantage over something like Kafka for streaming use cases because um, it's still you know our 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 file store is still really efficient at being able to just whip through these messages in sequential order. But it's also very very good at saying oh I just want this message or I want to start here or I want to you know grab this one and this one or grab these ones in bulk. Um, and so you could do things like a key value store with the same exact kind of format with the same exact um, semantics in a lot of ways, um, and, and that makes it really special. Uh, I mean, the, the, the same with the same thing. You could even, you know, uh, essentially have a like a, a work queue where you're picking things off the queue, and as soon as you process them or acknowledge them, you know, they get, um, you know, they get removed from that actual stream. Um, so there's lots of ways to be able to express these patterns and like all the gradations in between, um, which I think a lot of teams find really useful because they might, you know, like a particular set of properties from from one technology but they're like but if it only did a little like a little <laughs> bit more of this and i we feel like we fit in that space where you're not having to pick and choose but in fact you could express kind of like really what you need to solve the problem okay yeah i, I can certainly see the appeal of that and i know without naming some other technologies people trying to it, picking okay i'm going to name technologies Kafka works really well as a kind of ordered log. They are trying to build on queue semantics on top of it. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you've got something like RabbitMQ that's trying to build persistence under it. I think they've done that now, but that was yes. always the thing. Take me through. Um, let's, let's take it from an individual message. 
when I send a message, take me through the data journey through disk and off the network. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the real answer is it depends, but I'm going to start with that Good. assumption that we're, we're a single node. And, and to, be, to be honest, like NATS is used in like very distributed use cases. So um, I, I just want to caveat that by saying most of the reasons people use NATS is because they're doing something highly distributed, whether it's very global or whether they're going out to the edge. And you're able to use all these kind of features in a very kind of arbitrary topology, if you will. Yeah, we have to let's talk start, about that, but let's start on the single yeah, case. Let's start yeah. with a single node. And so um, the idea here is, like I said, everything starts with that kind of like what we call core NATs, which is that pub sub, you know, request reply, but it's all um, uh, it, it's all ephemeral in a sense where, you know, both clients have to be online for, you know, a publisher to publish the message and then the receiver to actually receive it. So there's no mm. persistence at the start. You know, in the beginning, there was no persistence. And, <laughs> is and there it's queuing? Cool. Is it ordered at this stage? It, it is, yeah, it is ordered. Things do okay. get like dequeued, but um, but it's still, uh, you know, th- th- we're we're not saving anything on disk. Um, it's all happening inside in buffers, right? And so, um, and and so it's important that we start with that because that's still usable. And there's there's actually a lot of really good use cases to do that. For instance. NAT sends a bunch of advisories about how the system's working. And those are just happening over core NATs. Um, and if nobody's interested in it, it actually just doesn't go anywhere, right? It doesn't, it never like UDK, leaves the network. Right? Yeah, it never leaves the network. But if, yeah. as soon as somebody subscribes and is interested in it, NATs will start delivering it to you. So you can have, you know, really interesting patterns expressed there. Things like logging, where, you know, you, you, you could still, stuff will still go over the network a little bit, but, you know, it wouldn't have, be a huge performance hit on the NAT server. Um, and so, uh, but, but to, so we start, we start with that like core request reply, um, where we're not hitting anything on disk. And then as soon as you want to start saving things on disk, you create a stream that's simply saying, I'm interested in this subject. And, um, and you do get a couple guarantees. So that now changes that, uh, that particular, you know, subject to, it's a request reply where somebody can say, I am now publishing a message on this subject as a request. And the response I want to get back is that it's been saved to disk. Um, okay. And yep. yeah, so that got saved into a stream. So that's, that's kind of like the publisher point of view, which is really simplistic and, you know, like it is just a really nice, easy graduation or step up from kind of the core NATS um, idea. You can even think of Jetstream or streams as, as a as a service that simply just saves things on disk, um, but still uses you know core NATS as its as its messaging layer. Okay. The um the consumer side is quite a bit more complicated because that's where a lot of the complexity lives in these types of systems. But um, a consumer is also something that's created, and the the consumer itself lives on the server. So the like you know the cursor of where the consumer is at and um, all of its configuration is uh, it lives there on the server. And that's that's actually one thing that's pretty um, you know advantageous compared to maybe some other systems is that um, when you're subscribing to a stream. You, you don't get a fire hose of that whole stream. A consumer can define, you know, and filter down exactly what data it wants and how much okay. of it. And, and, and it gets to define the conditions of, you know, what, what part, what parts of the game it wants to play. And, um, and that makes for a really interesting, you know, set of use cases because you don't have to really design ahead of time, like, ah, uh, how many partitions do I need? Or how many topics do I need to break down here? Because, um, you know, I might run into performance issues, or I, I will overload the client or overload the network. Um, you, you actually can really, you know, in a very fine grained way, filter down with consumers um, to get exactly what you want. Um, and that way, you, you have a lot of control over your network. Uh, which is really important for us because we do a lot of things at the edge where network is actually like one of the hard constraints. Um, you know, you might get like, uh, we, we have some customers that are like, we have like an hour total of like 4G signal or 5G <laughs> signal like for the day. And we need to be able to store and forward these things efficiently um, and, and make sure that we're we're just targeting the data that we need. And so that's an example of why it's important for us to be able to kind of do that. So anyway, you define a consumer, you get to filter that down, and that consumer is able to, um, there, there's a lot of different models for being able to choose you know, what to acknowledge and what way we want to acknowledge them. But um, long story short, the consumer you know, is able to pull down um, or be pushed the data and uh, acknowledges it. And the you know, Nats manages that whole life cycle. So your typical kind of publisher 
consumer model that you might see in technologies like Kafka or Pulsar um, do exist here, just in so, with some slightly different properties, I'd say. Do we have the thing of, um, I mean, there are two ways, two big ways you want to treat a stream like that. One is I read the stuff and that's it done with. I've consumed, I've literally consumed, I've used it up. And the mm. other is I want to read it for my purposes, but everyone else should be able to read it without setting up additional queues to duplicate it. Yeah, and that's one of the flexibility of streams is um, that all is defined in what we call a retention policy. And so by default, streams have a retention policy of just, you know, li- what we call limits, which is like, ah, I want this stuff to live in the stream for 30 days, or I want a million messages total, and then we'll start evicting, okay. st- either evicting stuff or refuse to accept more things into the stream. You can also define define that. But um, then we start graduating into other kind of policies where we might want a policy that's more like a work queue, where somebody is picking off, you know, stuff or multiple people are picking off stuff from the stream and it's being load balanced between those two things um, or those multiple things and uh, and then as soon as the stuff's processed we simply just remove it from the stream that's also another policy that we could set um, we even can graduate one level higher than that and say oh this is an interest based stream where we might have you know a bunch of different types of consumers picking things off and as soon as everybody who's interested in it you know is is oh. done with it then then we'll evict it so there's a lot of right. There's a lot of configuration, but what it looks like is you could like uh, now I'm, I'm sure you can kind of see, oh, you can do something kind of like Kafka or Pulsar. You can do something kind of like RabbitMQ and these can exist, you know, these can coexist with each other in a single system. OK, yeah, I can see that. I can see how it might be configurable. That makes me think that I'm trading something off like performance <laughs> or scalability. So talk to yeah. me about performance of it first. Yeah, so I'd say that like uh, and and I'll yeah I'll be completely honest in the sense because like people ask me all the time what are the trade offs here um, and I'd say like I I think there's a lot of advantages to like well I'll just use technology there's a lot of advantages to something like Kafka like I I don't want to convince anybody who has what I would say like a back of house Kafka deployment data lake, huge investment in the ecosystem, a lot of like data scientists, you know, work working with this. Um, I, I don't think there's there's a lot of like advantage to using something like Nats there, especially because one of the requirements there is that like um, that there's a that, that they're able to just push a lot of bandwidth through that system. Right. Yeah. And and I think um, like Kafka is probably going to beat Nats out <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of that. But it's still very competitive. Um, like, uh, it's not like orders of magnitude or even close to, to that level of performance, um, uh, difference. What I would say Nats really excels at is going to places where some of these technologies can't. So out to the edge into smaller devices. And then Nats is also just very good at things that are very highly distributed. So, um, if, if you want a more global deployment and you want to deploy across multiple regions, you know, um, it's much easier to use something like Nats to say, I want to replicate all of these streams everywhere playing by my rules. Um, right. ra- you know, rather than trying to use something like a, a mirror maker or, you know, any other technology that's trying to do that. Um, N- Nats is kind of built from the ground up with distribution in mind, um, rather okay, than that, centralization. That makes me want to ask about a specific case because I saw among the different clients, client libraries you can get for Nats is an Arduino library. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. thought, okay, so this is, is this something I'm going to use for like MQTT, IoT type stuff? Yeah. If yeah. And like that's global fleets of stuff to deal with. Totally. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's one of the things that we, we feel like we do really, really well at is if you have an IoT use case or a global fleet. I mean, we work with customers where we're like, we're inside of like vehicle, electric vehicles and we're like, you know, c- control, like all, all, there's all these microservices doing the infotainment, let's say, for <laughs> this vehicle. And they want to store and forward data. They want to communicate between each other. And so like there's a NAT server or two NAT servers like inside those electric vehicles facilitating that. The NAT servers are also in the cloud. The NAT server is also on the factory floor. And all these things are connected and working right. you know, with each other. Hang on, step back a second. Why would there be a server in the car rather than the client? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, the so one of the concepts that we like to talk about a lot is this idea of location transparency. Meaning, uh, if I'm a microservice or I'm a, I'm a piece of data or a stream, uh, you know, we 
the idea of location transparency is I want to be able to communicate with things I want to, I want to be able to talk about the things I want to talk about, these subjects, these topics, without worrying about where I am or where that other person is. And so the idea of location transparency is like, you know, I don't care whether you're in the cloud or you're right here next to me. Um, I just want to be able to talk to you about it. And I want Nats to figure out all the efficiencies, like all of the, how many hops do I, network hops do I need to do um, to be able to facilitate that. And what, what that, what that looks like in practice is you have these like services that can talk to each other that are kind of nomadic. So imagine for a second that, that you have this service that's in the cloud for your, for your vehicles or your fleet. And, um, you know, you discovered that like, it's, it's actually not great to have that service in there because the vehicle relies on it a lot more than uh, than we thought it would. And vehicles obviously have intermittent connectivity. They go yeah. online and offline. And so maybe it's, maybe it's feasible for you to bring that service into the car itself um, to be able to answer those questions or do whatever it needs to do. Um, that, that's a, that's a really good example of like, you just take that service and you put it in the car. You not no like difference in configuration or having to configure some reverse proxy or whatever um, with HTTP, that would be kind of difficult. Right. But with yeah. Nats, it's, it's kind of just seamless because they're all talking on the same subject. And so the idea that you have separate servers is this kind of um, you want to create this idea of location transparency. And then, and that um, also applies to data. So imagine for a second that you're in a car, these things are talking and they're saving data. Maybe they're saving data to a key value store. Maybe they're saving it to a stream. And you want to be able to take that data and maybe have either a digital twin of it or um, some sort of you know replica of it or or at least get the data into the cloud so it can be processed later. That's mm-hmm. also very easy to express in NATS with a concept we call mirrors and sources. Um, so th- th- there's a lot of really cool ways that you can express that. And NATS was built for that kind of like large scale IoT fleet management use case. Okay, this makes me think of something specifically that I've wanted in the past, which is you're writing an iPhone app or an Android app. And because you want it modern and interactive, you I I, I want a WebSocket communicating to the server, sending messages, streaming live stuff back. But I also want when the person goes into the underground or, you know, into a tunnel. I want the messages that they would have sent to be queued up and saved until we're reconnected. And mm-hmm. I want the data that I have received in the past to still be queryable. Yes. To, to do a good enough experience. Yep. How would I find that if I chose Nats? Yeah. So, I mean, mo- mobile apps are probably a little bit more tricky because of, you know, what you can run on there. But Nats is, you know, Nats is a small, Nat, the Nats server is a small, like, you know, 17 meg Go binary. Um, I I even have it like running in the browser, um, via Wasm. Um, so I can do cool NAT stuff there. Uh, so technically feasibly you could actually run it, you know, in a browser session and have a web app that does that same thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like primarily the use case is kind of like if you have some form of locality and you want to just treat this, like it's, I'm connected to the NAT system. Um, your services don't really have to care whether or not it's online or offline. Um, it could still just start, you know, sending messages to the stream, query the data and pretend like everything's hunky dory. And on the NAT side, it kind of solves for when it's reconnected, it resyncs that data, however you've kind of configured it. Um, okay. and so you kind of have this global local, um, system that's, that's, that's really resilient to, you know, intermittent connectivity and, and still allows you to write applications that, you know, pretend like everything's okay. Okay. In that case, let's build up onto this. Um, that sounds promising. The next thing I'm going to be interested in on top of that is some kind of database. And you've mentioned key value stores and indexing. So tell me about that setup. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I think, you know, one of the most popular databases, probably like, you know, a, a relational database management system, like a SQL, yep. you know, and, and we don't touch that. I think we think that that space has so much great options there um, that Nats doesn't get involved with that space. But what okay. we do want to solve for is stuff that is, um, you know, that, that would benefit from like high distribution. And so we we decided, hey, we got a stream, we're indexing all these subjects. What does it look like for us to do a key value store? Because we already do have kind of this idea of, hey, I know what the subject is and I just want to get it. 
Um, and so, uh, like I said, uh, before the, the key value store is really just a stream underneath. It's just a bunch of messages. Um, they are still ordered, so you can do really fun stuff with that, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but you know, uh, simply what a key value store is, is being able to send a message on a particular subject and that's indexes it based on that subject. And I could get it very, very quickly. Um, and uh, the neat thing about having it be a stream underneath and having that be, you know, globally ordered set of messages is that you can um, you can have things like history in a key value store saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I want a key value store and I want a history of 10. And so, you know, a policy oh, set up right. that that allows you to, you know, um, be able to have like a historical you know value that you could whip through for that particular key um and that just kind of comes for free because it's a stream underneath the hood um we also have you know uh more stuff coming for a key value store in the future a very near future like being able to have like you know lists and maps and be able to express kind of those lightweight data structures um alongside the key value store and that's kind of a constant you know uh, a collaboration between the clients and the server to to be able to express that um, but uh, yeah the, the the cool thing about the key value store is we have people using it in highly distributed use cases whether they want a global key value store that's kind of replicated across the globe that offers low latency or maybe you're taking some big key value store in the cloud and you want to like demux it or filter it down so that there's, you know, at the edge, you're getting a replica of it. So it's easy to query when offline, but it's only a subset. Um, and you could do that okay. with Nats as well. So could I do like a, a per user subset? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we have people do, doing that as well, because sometimes it's a lot easier to say, hey, I just want one big key value store in, you know, the cloud uh, with all of my tenants in it. And then I want to filter it down to, you know, a particular context or tenant. Um, or location, or you know, whatever whatever your business kind of defines as a, a unit that it might be independent from one another. Would it require that I plan up front to have my tenant ID in my subject? Yes, and so that that's kind of the thing to be thinking about is that your subject is where everything gets indexed. So if there's anything you possibly want to index on or wildcard with, you know, you would probably want to um, define those things inside of the subject. And, um, and but that's where things get really really interesting, right? Is because you can. Uh, you know, you can filter those things down. You can say, hey, I, uh, maybe you don't want a history, but maybe you want to say, hey, I want to like watch all of these keys, you know, and you could do that as a client. You could say, hey, I just want to essentially open up a channel to like send me any sort of updates to these keys. So maybe I, maybe I'm not even using a NAT server next to me, but I want to be able to get these updates delivered to me so I can have my own like in memory cache of that. Um, okay, it's really, yeah, really yeah. fast. Yeah. That makes me wonder, just thinking of thorny problems here, uh, do you get the issue where one day you wake up and you wish you put another key in the subject and now you need to rewrite all your subjects? Yeah, we, we do have that. And there's some ways to, to, to you know, get around that. Um, you could use some lightweight stream processing tools. Like I know you had Ash on to talk about Benthos like a while back. Yeah. And, um, and, and we're, we're big fans of that project. Um, the, the other thing that you can do as well is, um, it's really easy to go from, you know, taking data in one stream and saying, I want it to go into this other stream. And there's no other like infrastructure that you have to set up around that. It's all configuration. So I can fear this one stream and say, I want to ingest from this other stream, essentially replicate this data. Um, and while it's going in, you could actually transform those subjects, um, okay. in certain ways. So we yeah. are getting into the question of stream processing. Is there a mm -hmm. logic and processing layer to this whole thing? So there's not a ton of logic um, to it. We we try to offload a lot of the like you know heavier weight stream processing to external tools or applications that people can write, um, and that's where I'd say like we there's room for improvement in the ecosystem here. I and mean, we have tools like Benthos that that people can use, but I wouldn't say that you know we have this official like. The official solution for Flink in Nats. Um, I don't think that's where we have, you know, um, our, our strong suit. Mainly because we're about distribution and performance um, w w with those particular constraints. And so, a lot of the heavier weight stream processing and windowing, all the things that really have to do with, you know, higher level analytics workloads, mm -hmm. um, th those things we tend to see towards the back of the house. Uh, maybe it's in a more centralized location where everything is converging into it. Um, whereas I think. We like have it. We're, we're more interested about data kind of in motion um, and moving right. all, all all over the place. Um, 
so so I hope that makes sense. Is you know yeah, yeah. We, we have plenty of pub. Yeah, it makes me wonder though. Like, so if you don't have that, a lot of that you can do with a good enough client library plus yes. the right guarantees about exactly once processing. Yep. Do you have uh, that? If I want to do the legwork myself. Yeah, and so you have the flexibility to express, you know, um, you know, at least once um, or exactly once uh, semantics, and the uh, and you know, there, there's trade offs to both of those, and I think that's one of the things that's interesting about Nats is like we we really try to make sure that those options are available, but that the trade offs are clear um, in terms of performance and in terms of chattiness to, to be able to get that. But yeah, like we, so we provide, you know, a, uh, I know Synadia, we su- officially support, I think like 13 client libraries at this time, but we have about yeah. four, 40 amongst the whole ecosystem. Um, <laughs> I looked and, through and the community. list and I saw ballerina as a programming yeah, language yeah. as one of them. So yeah. what on earth is that? Yeah, so I mean, the community has done a really good job, um, you know, implementing clients. But what we really try to do is um, we have a lot of really bright people on our team and and as part of the maintainers that try. We, we really try to create a cohesive set of client libraries that have all of the features that we would consider necessary, so that you can you can plan out your design without having to worry about oh, but like what if like what if exactly once delivery isn't part of this client library, right? right we want to yeah, make sure yeah. that, that that's in there. Not only that, though, we want to also make sure that it's idiomatic to, like, um, to the language and to that language's community. And so when you pick up a Go client or REST client, you're, you're guaranteed to have all of the features that we've defined in the specification for a client. Um, but uh, you're not going to see, like, what I what I've seen before, and I've gotten like horror stories about, is like, oh, like we have all this client library support, but it's obvious that it was like really written by a team <laughs> that is really knowledgeable in this one language, and yeah, uh, yeah. and and so we wanted to kind of create an idiomatic experience while also covering the gamut in terms of feature set, and so that's what people would expect to see is that like teams can uh, essentially you know write all of this create all the same outcomes with the client libraries you know, uh, and, okay. and with the idiomatic okay. implementation of it. Yeah, that's definitely a problem I've seen where, I mean, it's a good, sensible way to scale it is to build your client library in C and then build everything that wraps the C, but you end yep. up with a language, with a library that looks C-ish. Something yes. Like yeah. Yeah. And okay. we want it to feel ergonomic for, for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we've hinted at it, at it a lot but let's actually get into it which is distribution the moment you start doing indexes um and load balancing across machines the whole um the whole queuing thing becomes a lot more difficult mm-hmm. so how do we deal with that yeah well first i want to kind of define distribution a little bit cuz um cuz i think it's it's it can mean a lot of things. Um, and you even kind of like m- my definition is uh, a little bit more higher level and it actually kind of cues into something you said earlier where it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not just one team, it's multiple teams. So I even start with distribution can also mean like organizational distribution where you have these other teams who are trying to do these different things. And, and, um, and we solve for that as well. We have this idea of true multi-tenancy where you have this logical isolation. Um, and even in some cases, physical isolation, if you need it, um, between multiple entities, but still belonging to a single system. And, um, and, and so there's, there's distribution like that, but then there's also things like geographic distribution. Maybe you're running things, you know, in multiple places across the globe. Um, maybe there's like more of a systemic distribution where you're saying, you know, we have stuff in the cloud and then we have stuff at the edge and we want these things to be able to communicate with each other, but also treat themselves as their own separate autonomous entities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so distribution can mean a lot of different things, um, but at the core of it, you, you you kind of you know hinted at the problem that like it, it, it a, a lot of new problems arise when you have a high level of distribution, um, whether it's figuring out where does this stream live, uh, how does it get replicated, where does it need to be replicated. There's a lot of decisions to make, um, and and to be honest, it's it's not like Nats is going to make those decisions for you. Like I think. 
in terms of edge and distribution, like we're still very early days. And I'd love to say that like we work, I work at a company that stamps out edge deployments. It's just, there's no business <laughs> and there's no business in a box for that. Right. right. But um, <laughs> we're also trying to figure out what, what that, what that secret sauce is in a lot of ways, but Nats is that toolkit for being able to express those things. And so um, from a technical standpoint, um, the cool thing about NAT servers is that uh, they can kind of be Lego bricks together. And the, the reason they can be Lego brick together is there's kind of three distinct, um, three distinct like levels of being able to express a topology. And what I mean by topology is like, okay, you have NAT servers. How do they you know, connect to each other, cluster together, right? And so right. you start with a single NAT server and that, that's, you know, that's great to play with. And that's totally fine. But then you start, gra- you know, you might need to start graduating for reliability, you know, sake, you know, into a cluster. And so okay. you, you, we have what's called a cluster of NAT servers where you could have, you know, um, uh, multiple NAT servers all communicating with each other. Um, and, uh, and w- we recommend that that goes, you know, that all these clustered NAT servers kind of live in a similar place. Maybe they're in a, you know, different availability zones, but in the same region, they don't have to be. And we have customers that actually create what we call stretch clusters, which are really interesting and fascinating. We could talk about that if you want, but, uh, we start with a cluster and then, um, that cluster, uh, can graduate into a super cluster, which is a cluster of clusters. And this is meant for <laughs> maybe larger scale global deployments, cross region, all over the world. We actually operate one of our own. Okay. And that's, that's a way to kind of get that globe spanning single system. So it doesn't matter where your services run, they can all still talk to each other. And NAS is very good about routing that request to the nearest responder. So imagine for a second that like, you know, you're in the UK and I'm, I'm in California and, um, you know, I, I want to talk about, you know, um, I want to talk about Nats with you, which is what I'm doing today. And yeah. you've, you've expressed interest that you wanted to respond to anybody who wants to talk about Nats. Let's just assume our subject is just called Nats. And so okay. I make a request to Nats and you can respond to me. And, um, I don't, it doesn't matter where that the fact that you're in the UK, I don't need to know you're in the UK. Um, Nats will figure out that you're in the UK and it will route that request across multiple Nats servers, multiple hops to be able to, you know, get to you so that you could respond to me and then it returns a message all the way back to me. Now that can incur a lot of latency because we're on other sides of the world. Um, so the, and this is, this kind of cues into the location transparency bit. We could take you and we could clone you because you're a service, not a person. (laughs) And we can, (laughs) we can, we can put, we we could put you, yeah, we could put you on the West coast of the U S and, um, and with like zero configuration changes, all, the only difference is that you're now on the West Coast of the U.S. and you're connected to a NAT server that's 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 over there. Um, I can now start making requests to NATs, and I get responses from you on the West Coast instead. Now, if you on the West Coast for some reason goes down, if I make requests, you on the U.K. is now responding to me. So you kind of have these properties mm-hmm. of like failover, disaster recovery, little bits of that, little bits of load balancing, and, and also just kind of this intelligent routing that's happening inside of a super cluster. How does this actually work? Because when I fire up my local NAT server, how am I discovering that there's a, a subject currently only in California called NAT? Yeah. Is that, I mean, so, is there some like kind of directory access service going on inside? So there's a couple things. Uh, the first thing I want to say is like this is this one is more secret to the servers themselves, but the servers keep an interest graph, which is big data structure of all the interest that exists in the world essentially. And those interest graphs get, uh, you know, obviously clients connect to a single server and they, you know, subscribe interest. So that that interest actually has to get propagated to its peers, not only its peers but also everybody else in the cluster. And so what Nats kind of facilitates for you is taking that interest and making sure all the other servers know about it so that each server can kind of do its best to say, oh, here's who I need to send it over to. So propagating messages or, or, you know, um, uh, messages tied to certain subjects um, can be efficiently routed. And so that's some under the hood machinery that's kind of interesting. But um, as far as like uh, what you're getting at, like a service discovery, we actually have kind of a, um, we have a little 
you know, we call it a service, um, you know, little service API. That's, that's all client side. It's all kind of, um, conventional, if you will, but it allows people to register themselves as a service. So you can have a directory of sorts. But the interesting thing about the directory is that it's not like we're, saving these things to a directory and then they have to keep, keep, keep getting pinged and then they eventually fall. It's not your typical service discovery service. It's, it's more of a, Hey, these things are saying I'm subscribing in to the, uh, I'm, I'm subscribing to the service subject. So whenever somebody says, Hey, what are all the services? Everybody else can self report. Um, and that's one of the oh, interesting okay. things about using messaging is like, it's not like HTTP where it's one-to-one I could have, I could send one message and get multiple responses back. And so we use that pattern to say, hey, all of the services, tell me who you are. Or all of the math services, tell me where you are or who you are. And they all self-report, you know, statistics about themselves, um, you know, they identify themselves. And you can use that as kind of a, uh, you know, a way to essentially fleet manage all of your services in a global context. Right, yeah, yeah. So you are using your own messaging system to manage your messaging system. Yeah, yeah, in a lot of ways. And <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we, we, we use our tools a lot. Um, we even have, you know, if, if uh, one of the other cool things is Nats has a, a CLI um, command line interface that's like really, really nice. It basically has all the features our, our client libraries have. And so it makes it really fun to prototype all these things, but also monitor and, you know, uh, you know, observe all of these things. You know, that's a very transparent system in the sense where I can subscribe on a catch all wildcard and literally see all of the traffic that's flowing into the system um, or filter it down even more. And so building tools around monitoring and observability or alerts, it's actually really, really easy because NATS is really easy to tap into. Right. What happens if I, I mean, I'm assuming a very large system here and I decide to tap into. I don't know a specific group of subject, a specific group of user IDs, or something. And the group I've chosen is too large for my local client. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to build up a mental picture here, and I've almost got an a local sub index coming onto my machine, but it's going to blow my machine. Yeah. So this is the this is the fun part about NATS is um, when you're tapping into that traffic, it's all going over core NATS. You're not creating a like a consumer. It's not it's not, you know, hitting any disk. It's literally just making mess- messages flow over the network. Um, and we've seen many circumstances where people will easily flood like 70 gigabit links via NATS. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, w- which is, which is great because NAT server is really performative, just moving that data. Um, we, we do have this kind of uh, concept of what we call a slow consumer, meaning if your computer can't keep up, NATS will eventually just, cut off the connection and be like, yeah, 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 you're too slow. Um, (laughs) And so, and so, and, and it'll tell you that. Um, And and so if you do like make a fat finger mistake and say like in a very heavy system and say, subscribe to everything, it will probably start sending you a bunch of data. Your computer can't keep up and it will just kind of cut it off at some point. Um, And so that's generally a pretty safe thing to do. Um, Obviously it gets a lot more complicated when you're doing persistence and saving things to disk and there you can run into some fat finger problems <laughs> there but um, we, we try to make sure it's it's pretty safe to be able to just send a bunch of data you know um, to your machine okay that makes me think of another safety of data thing that comes up in these systems when they are persistent and this is kind of a, a very simple pattern but it's something people want to know about is if someone makes Let's talk about data schemas and what happens when they go wrong, right? Someone mm-hmm. sends a certain format of message in a lot of systems. They, they send a message that's the wrong format, and in many systems, that's kind of a poison pill that causes everything to back up until somehow you deal with the broken message and free up the queue. Mm-hmm. Do you have those kinds of data guarantees and ways of mitigating them when they break? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, what we do is we have constructs that you're able to create there. It's not like we have guarantees from the bottom up um, because there's they're all a set, series of trade-offs, right? And we want to try yeah. to be as flexible as possible for people to make those, those trade-off decisions. But um, what we do have is... Um, I, I kind of mentioned advisories, and so uh, you, you can configure uh, a NATS stream to say, "Hey, here's kind of like the maximum amount of retries I want to give to this particular message before 
I, I just say, hey, this thing is not processable and we'll just, we'll keep it in the queue and then we'll admit, you know, an advisory saying this thing was not great. And so while we don't have, um, you know, official dead letter queues, we have a bunch of like semantics that can be composed into one. And what we found in, you know, in practice is that like everybody has a different definition of what a dead letter queue um, <laughs> yeah. can, can, can look like. So we don't want to have a strong opinion just yet on it. Um, but even back to schemas, like schemas are also schema management or even schema registries are also a hard problem. Schema validation, being able to try to keep data clean um, to the point where we also don't want to necessarily have too strong of opinion there either. We, we want to try to help our customers like, you know, do things better with schemas. But often I come into an organization and they're like, we want, you know, to make sure our data is clean on this stream. Um, should we do schema validation before it goes into the stream and kind of guarantee it looks a certain way? And it's like, yeah. that's one way to do it, but you're also creating potentially new problems when you want to have a new version of that schema. How do you want to migrate those clients over? Oh, where are the, where do those clients live? Oh, they're IOT devices all over the world. It's like, well, that's probably not a <laughs> practical thing to do. So like in, in a circumstance like that, where you don't maybe not have a lot of control over the data that's coming in, the, the cool thing about Nats is that there's this fluidity in the, the streaming and the streams themselves, or maybe you want to set up a stream that's like your ingest stream. Let the garbage, let all the garbage go there, and have some form of you know consumer on that stream that's reconciling that data, you know, to what you need it to be before it goes into a cleaner stream. Um, and you might incur a little bit more you know latency with a process like that, but that's at a trade off of saying we have very clean data. Um, and we, yeah. we, we're, we, and we can, we can try to mitigate as many potential poison pills as possible. Um, and so like it's, it's interesting, it's interesting because those set of problems can, you know, you could look at them and say, oh, here's the solution for it. But, um, quite often, depending on the constraints, it can look very, very different. Yeah. 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 This is reminding me very much of like untyped actors, that kind of model. Mm -hmm. but with yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we don't want to have, uh, as, as, uh, maintainers of the project, we don't have want to have too many opinions on trying to keep things, um, you know, from like a governance perspective, <laughs> super, super squeaky clean, because that there's just so much gray area there. Um, but we do want to focus on the internal machinery and making sure things are, you know, consistent and replicated and that the data itself is not corrupted because of the system. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but not too many, too many opinions on how one kind of creates a system of governance around that data. Okay. Okay. Well, in that case, we're getting into kind of supporting systems around this. So um, tell me a bit about two sides to this, which instantly come up is <laughs> distributed systems. Do I have to run Zookeeper? <laughs> question one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you don't have to run Zookeeper <laughs> at all, which is really nice. That's, a, okay. it's a, that's, that's one plus. That's one plus. Okay. And the other is like monitoring. You said I can just subscribe to anything from the command line client, but what are the monitoring kind of tools around this? Yeah, so um, Nats is a, a, a CNCF project, a, a cloud native computing foundation. Um, okay. sa same same as Kubernetes. It, uh, Nats is actually one of the oldest um, uh, CNCF projects, even older than yeah. Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, naturally, we have some ecosystem support for that. Um, we we built monitoring tools that um, essentially do what you said. They just subscribe to a lot of subjects, or or they do that pattern that I said. But instead of services, they actually t say servers. They're like, "Hey, servers, give me all of your stats," and oh, yeah, it basically yeah. just does. So instead of having to do an HTTP scrape and know where all of those servers are, you know, like a typical Prometheus, um, you know, exporter would, um, we actually just use Nats to get all of the monitoring endpoints. And so that's called Nats Surveyor. And, um, and that's one option that you can use. And if you want to go to the more traditional method of using Prometheus and scraping via HTTP, um, because maybe you've exposed, you know, that we do have HTTP monitoring endpoints for those as well. Um, we, we have a Nats Prometheus exporter that does more of the traditional method as oh, well. Yeah. So, so you, you kind of have, you know, the best of both worlds there. Um, and people use them in combination with each other. And we have Grafana dashboards and things like that. Um, and, but, you know, uh, in addition to that, we, we have a new set of features coming to NAT server around um, around distributed tracing. 
um, where you know it's basically firing a tr- you're able to to get reports on um, the life cycle of a message, which is actually really interesting because not yeah. only do you see where what client the message came from and where where it arrived at, but you also see all the servers it passed through, and maybe even you know if it's crossed from one tenant over to another, you get a lot of information around that. And so um, you, you can do a lot with that in the future. Would that require me to change the producing code that initially writes the message? No, not necessarily. Um, oh, okay. there, you, you, can, you can configure it that way, but you could also configure it as a, a server or account configuration saying, hey, I just want this subject to be you know, traceable. And now it's okay. going to emit advisories that you can then use however you want. And so that's kind of the beauty of the system is you can configure things and say, hey, yeah, yeah, I want this thing to be observed. I want this thing to you know be monitored. And, and you can then subscribe on a particular subject of your choosing the, where those events would be emitted. Um, and the, the cool part about it is since it's all subjects, it's like you can have a service that looks at that, or you can be like, I just want to throw that stuff into a stream so I can consume it later. And that's such yeah. a immediate, like you're using your own internal events and saying, put them in a stream for me. And okay. it's just, it's really fun. It does sound fun. Yeah. Okay. So we, this is leaning into connectivity. Maybe I should jump back to my desire for more of a database on top of things. Mm-hmm. Can I do things like uh, connect? Have you got like a connector framework where I might stream the data into Postgres or DuckDB or something like that? Yeah. You know, we're, 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 I know we're working on, um, a series of connectors. We have, we have a series of kind of bespoke connectors, but that connector framework has been something that's been asked about for a long time. And, and we've been wanting to lean on the open source community a bit more for this, which is why we're a big fan of Benthos. And mm-hmm. you'll see if you, if you look at, you know, uh, Benthos, you'll see uh, there's a lot of NAT support for it. Whether you want to do KVs or microservices or object stores, you kind of have the full stack available to you. And we wanted to make sure we support projects like that. And we're going to continue to do that. Um, but uh, I know Synadia internally, we're working on more connectors as well. Um, right now, the extent is like, you'll, you'll find, like I said, more bespoke connectors. We have an Nats Kafka bridge, if you just want to move a bunch of data in there. Um, but uh, it, right now, it's kind of down to like using more of an open source library that's great at that. And w- one of the reasons for that is it's um, inevitably when you start talking about, I want to take data from one system and put it into another, it's easy. The connecting part is really easy, but inevitably people are like, we would need to transform this data. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's where you get into a little bit more complexity for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Some of the hard part is not going from... And that's the Postgres so much as going from event based to relational. Yeah. Yeah. And figuring yeah, yeah. out what do you want to do with it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Okay. Um, so let me let me get into the really concrete stuff because uh, I'm tempted to go and play with this properly. If I was looking at a system of microservices, which so let's say I was designing it and I was thinking, okay, HTTP for most stuff. I want some WebSocket stuff maybe some queuing and some of these queues should be persistent mm-hmm. would are you saying you think it'd be sensible to use nats for all of this absolutely yeah i mean that's a perfect use case where when people are starting to look at mixing patterns and and maybe they're saying like oh yeah what off the shelf technologies do we want to do to be able to pull this off i mean you could use nats for for all of that you know uh, the the communication um, between the microservices uh, you know if you, if you're not using http and you're using nats instead you kind of got rid of a cert- like needing a service discovery mechanism needing to use dns um, in between all of these rpc calls as yeah. well as like uh, uh, using some sort of load balancer to load balance between them um, and it's not just load balancing in a local context, it's in a, that global context as well, which actually gets a bit more complicated. If you're going multi-cloud and you're trying to wrangle between multiple cloud load balancers and there's slight differences with how they work, um, anybody who's done that <laughs> knows the pain of what that can look like. And that's kind of is the regulator between all of that, where you don't need it. And, and Nats can kind of just have a, a single um, construct for being able to have services in multiple clouds or on-prem versus cloud or edge. Um, all, all of that stuff is is transparent and just kind of works. Um, what what does that system. look like? As let's say I've got five HTTP servers. What would have been HTTP servers mm. servicing my request response stuff? Mm. Today I want to add a sixth, and tomorrow two of them are going to crash, so I fall down to a fourth. 
Mm-hmm. What's that? How automatic is that load balancing as things come in and out? I mean, yeah, it's 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 immediate. So um, the the NAT server is really good about um, the, the the cool thing about it is the NAT server is the connection between a a, a service and a NAT server is persistent, meaning uh, w- which like HTTP really isn't. It's not a persistent connection. It's establishing a new connection every time, which creates some weird issues, uh, especially when it comes to like what happens when something crashes. Um, uh, so the NAT server is really good about being like, oh, that, that, that connection was severed. And I knew that it was subscribed on these things and maybe it will come back up. So I might hold on to it a little bit longer, but I'm going to make sure like it doesn't participate in this load balancing. Like I know it's offline. Right. Um, and so the, the NAT server is really good about figuring all of those things out. Um, and in a very, you know, immediate fashion, um, to where, you know, something crashes and it's okay. Like that server will just continue to route requests to the other, um, to the other ones. And so, um, I think that's a really nice property because you're not wrangling multiple technologies to try to pull something like that off. It's just automatic and there's zero configuration to, to want to do that. Okay. Okay. So if I want to go and prototype a system like this, give me some mm-hmm. advice on how to get started. Uh, the best way I would say to get started is just good to go and uh, download the NAT server and the NAT CLI. And then I have a um, I have a video series, even the very first one, where I show load balancing. And it's it's really that easy. It's just saying NAT sub and you provide a queue, which is just basically your your group that you want to be a part of. Um, and then uh, you know you could just create multiple of those, start sending messages to them, and seeing them load balance. You could even just say, all right, send me a thousand messages, like every, you know, w- one every, you know, 10 milliseconds. And you see these things kind of spin yeah. through and you could just take things offline, pull them off back online, just, you know, multiple terminal windows and just observe it for yourself. Um, it's, it's really, it's really nice. <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask a question specifically for me here where um, I've been through that tutorial video that you did. Uh, and I, it's it's good. What's my next step? How do I switch on persistence? Yeah. So to to turn on something like Jetstream, um, we we actually make it an opt in feature for for NATs um, yeah. because we we know that persistence is like a whole new set of problems to <laughs> introduce. Um, and and we wanted to say, hey, NAT server by itself is like stateless, right? You can pull these things up or down. But as soon as you introduce state, things get complicated. So um, the the system uh, for persistence is called Jetstream, and you can just turn it on in a NAT server with a either a server configuration, if you're using configuration file, or just a, a flag if you're firing up the server. And, um, and that will turn on persistence. And what that does is it allows you to then um, be able to use the Jetstream API. And we have the API... We have access to the API inside of the NAT CLI where you can just say, you know, NAT's stream add whatever you want your stream name to be. And then mm-hmm. it walks you through a little walkthrough to say like, oh yeah, what subjects do you want to ingest into this stream? And how do you want to configure all of this stuff? Okay. Um, okay. And so you can just create those streams on the fly like that. Um, there's plenty of other ways to create streams as well. You can create them directly in the client SDKs with your code. Um, you know, pl- plenty of you know different different options for you. But like, yeah, it's really nice in the CLI to be able to just like, yeah, create a stream for me, and then start sending messages into it. Um, and you could just start, you know, consuming those messages as well. Okay, are those two separate systems? I mean, are they separately licensed? No, they're not separately licensed. It's Jetstream is bundled into a NAT server, but it's opt-in. And we wanted to be explicit about that just because they're two different sets of problems um, to, to to work through. Um, but uh, yeah, not separately licensed. They're, they're all bundled into the NAT server, all part of Apache 2. They're not even separate repos or anything like that. Um, it's just more of an opt-in feature. Okay, okay. Sounds like I need to go and play with it and <laughs> try it with Ballerina. It's my new favorite yeah, programming yeah, exactly. language name. <laughs> the ba- yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much more that goes into Jetstream and how we implemented our raft layer and how all of that complexity, you know, gets gets wrangled. Um, but it actually is pretty still very. I would I would say the best way I could describe Nats in terms of like properties is like compared to other technologies, it's like so fluid um, in the sense where we we work with a lot of customers where we start with something but there's confidence that like oh we can continue to iterate on this system without painting ourselves into like a really bad corner by not doing enough <laughs> upfront design and i know in distributed systems that's a really hard thing to do um because design decisions are ha- have a lot of cost to it but yeah. for some 
for some weird reason, that's has this fluidity to it where um, we encourage kind of this play. Um, maybe not in production, but um, <laughs> to, a, as you're working through and testing out your system, it is really, really fun to play with. So I encourage anybody watching this to just like download Nat CLI, download Nat server, and just to like start playing with things and not worry too much about, am I going to break the world? Because NAS is pretty <laughs> resilient um, with that. And and I prototypes take, instead of prototypes taking days, you know, it's like hours you know, you can you can actually get a really nice working prototype up in an afternoon, which is really really cool. I can tell that you find it fun, so maybe we will. Oh, yeah, it's no, it's a bunch of fun. Cool. Well, excellent. I'm going to go and give it. Uh, well, I've gone through your initial tutorial, but I think I might go and give it more of a try and definitely get persistence running because that's something that particularly interests me. My data is valuable. Yes, absolutely. Keep it valuable. <laughs> cool, <laughs> Jeremy. Thank you very much for taking me through it. Thanks, Chris. It was nice talking with you. Thank you, Jeremy. That puts Nats on my list of technologies to put through their paces. And on top of that, I've got to go and look at Ballerina Lang. That one hooks me in just on the strength of the name. But I took a quick look and it actually looks really interesting. So if you're involved in Ballerina or you know someone who is, please get in touch. My contact details are in the show notes, along with links to everything Jeremy and I discussed in this episode. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like it, rate it, or share it with a friend. And if you like developer voices generally, as I said in the intro, there's now a way to support it if you want to. There are a couple of ways to do it. There's now a Patreon account and there are YouTube memberships. I'm trying to keep them exactly the same. And they have three tiers of support, which I've named coffee, wine, and put it on the marketing budget. I'm still figuring out exactly what the perks are going to look like and what we're going to do, but I've already had some sign-ups for all three tiers, so we're going to agile this one. Ship it, iterate it. If you've already signed up, thank you so much for supporting me. And uh, if you're about to sign up, thank you too. We'll be back next week with another delightful mind from the world of software. But until then, I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Jeremy Sines. Thanks for listening.